A huge shout out to, to Hyde and uh, the Jaguar crew uh, for flying me halfway around the world. Uh, it's very uh, difficult to get right flights and, and quite expensive as well. Um, got to know Hyde. Uh, he was doing his PhD at my old my workplace at River Lee. And uh, it's great to see uh, Hyatt's face and a n number of other faces I hadn't seen for three or four years. So you're probably thinking, why in the hell is a, this bloody Australian nutritionist going to talk about stall-free production? Um, and it's quite a, and it's, it's not quite a secret, but I don't try to, to gloat too much, that I really wanted to be a piggery manager. So I was sick of being broke at university. And I joined River Lee and as a graduate program, so I went through a 6,000 uh, sale unit down to a very old 600 sale units. And it was quite a, and did that for two years. And I saw the best and worst. Um, saw the, uh, the, the brand new and innovations. Uh, there was an R&D unit that just finished where, where Hyatt did his PhD. Then nutrition uh, opportunity came along and, and the rest was history. But any opportunity I get, I'll put on gumboots and overalls and I really enjoy with my current position to work with the integrators, uh, sorry, the innovators, uh, not only the integrators but the small piggeries. Some of the most innovative units I've seen is a, a 300 sour unit and uh, they have to be uh, incorporate new technology uh, to stay ahead of the big guys. I'll get prepared here, so that's a green button. Great. So, I know there's a lot going on with uh, the, the Prop 12 and, and uh, we'll see what happens today with uh, the discussions. We were driven by supermarkets. So, Coles, who were really struggling against uh, the largest supermarket in Australia, decided to bring out these uh, uh, Englishmen, Brits from Tesco, and to get more people through the door, they decided to rebrand all their food and they decided, and Coles were uh, selling 35% of pig, uh, fresh pork in Australia, and they decided, well, let's go store free. And they gave the industry or their customers three years uh, to, to change. Then Woolworths, which is the largest supermarket, decided to follow the same lead. So, Pig community, the largest integrators, including uh, River Lee, uh, and also the, the levy paid uh, uh, governance, decided to, well, look, let's not stagnate, let's be proactive. And so the whole Australian industry decided by later that year, in, in, uh, in um, November 2010, to go store free. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of conjecture and then suddenly Coles decided in 2014 to say, we're not going to give you five, five days um, store time because that was uh, um, the basic Coles said, OK, we'll give you five days after insemination, then you have to move your sales. Then 2014, Coles said, no, <clears throat> we want zero time in stalls after insemination uh, and also uh, enrichment. Enrichment was you know, chains hanging from ceilings, old footballs, you name it. Um, some tried to use straw, but that just blocked up pits. Now, there was a little bit of uh, fallback, and then the Coles decided that, OK, I'll give us 12 hours to move uh, sales after insemination. So, of course, when that came through, uh, the sky was falling. There was a lot of panic in the industry. Um, what, what was it going to do to reproductive performance? Uh, and the innovators did very well. Uh, they decided to spend money and bring in uh, electronic sale feeders or, and redesigning the units. But there's a lot of angle grinders that came out. And they just turned stalls, individual stalls, into, into shoulder stalls. Uh, some decided that they'd have two sales per stall uh, just to try and cut cost. And reproductive performance just crashed. Uh, uh, we're getting, back then, 10 years ago, you know, we're getting high 80s, even 90s in farrowing rate. And then suddenly we had units doing 65, particularly during summer. But the innovators did very well and uh, they are still ahead of the, the party now. If you want to get your cameras out, I suppose these are things that we learnt that you must do when you go store free. 
uh, you must move sows within five days of insemination. And I'll go into the reasons soon. Uh, oops. <clears throat> because it's, uh, we've gone from an individual stall to group housing, there is a big requirement to make sure that sow has enough gut fill, doesn't fight, because straight after insemination, uh, estrogen levels are through the roof and sows are fighting like a football team on, on, uh, on whiskey and beer. They are, if they're going to be aggressive, it's going to be in the first five to seven days. So increased feed intake by that, that 14% in the first 20, 28 days. There's a lot of research to, to back that up. I know 20 feet seems like a, a, a large distance for, for flight, at least 15, ideally 20, and I'll go into reasons soon. Functional fibre is must, and it's probably one thing that we as nutritionists are still learning and don't know enough about. So I'll attempt to give a, a brief uh, idea of what we've learnt and what type of functional fibre will work to improve gut fill and maximise satiety. One thing I won't go into anymore, but that last point, do not change the population more than 10% within a five-day period. It's okay for a couple of sales here and there. Every time we change the population by more than 10%, we start getting uh, big reductions in, in, um, in born alive, so increasing embryo loss in, in abortions. <clears throat> Timing after mating. So even though implantation is around about day 13, it's amazing the amount of stress and cortisol levels that actually increase progesterone, um, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, the prostaglandins. And of course, if you get in stress and you have increase in prostaglandins, that depresses progesterone and that leads to embryo loss. We had several operations where they uh, decided that there was too much fighting within the first two, three or four days. Let's put them into a, a holding pen so they can cool off before they start going into a, a larger pen. And every day, it was delayed after five days, born alive went down. We had born alive of six and sevens in some cells. So uh, I can't stipulate any more that five days they need to be put into their pen and, and left alone. As I mentioned, particularly right after mating and uh, when they go into the first uh, three or four weeks, that's when estrogen levels are the highest and that's when sales are going to fight. So to reduce that aggression, and of course there's a lot of things about pen design that reduces that as well, uh, is trying to maximise gut fill. Now functional fibre is part of that, but we really uh, need to increase the feeding rate. When I first uh, was a nutritionist, and we were taught by the, the Nottingham crew over in the UK that if you overfeed in, in the first 28 days, you're going to reduce uh, progesterone and, and reduce uh, born alive and, and, and get increase in failing of pregnancies. Well, research that the Australian pork CRC run by Dr Campbell um, did during this time uh, it, from 2010 to 2015 showed that we actually got better performance when we increased feeding rate by about 14%. And there is a little bit of information there showing that maybe we're actually increasing the nutritional plane early. Uh, so when you have that... Um, uh, early amniotic development, you're maximising muscle fibre, birth weight, and there's indications we are increasing birth weight when we do have a higher plane of nutrition for the first 28 days. But then it's reduced because uh, we can't afford fat sales. Probably a bit controversial, but I, you talk to an animal behaviourist and you ask them a question, what is the ideal stocking rate? and they'll spend an hour going through all the different figures. It could be 1.8, it could be up to three. It's one of the most frustrating conversations uh, I've, I continue to have. And I don't think it is about stocking rate. Sure, I think we need to have a minimum of 1.8 square metres, but it's all about flight distance, so that submissive sale. So you're going to have aggressive sales, you're just going to need uh, to be able to design the pen well enough um, and I can try and get this pointer working. So you have enough area for that submissive sow to get away from the aggressor, because the sow, aggressive sow will only go so far and give up. And 
when it comes to uh, pen design, that is an absolute must. I can't state that enough. <clears throat> I've got a couple of copies of this uh, on the table, um, but this is a really good uh, paper that the Pork Sour C uh, did. There was a lot of research. I think we must have spent about $15 million worth of um, uh, research funds to see what was the best way to manage store-free sales. Uh, it's readily available on the web. Uh, take a photo. If uh, the first uh, two people to me can grab a copy here um, and cause this presentation, uh, I'll give to Hyatt and the crew so you can have a look at this as well. But it, is a it's, it doesn't answer all the questions, but it is a really good go-to reference. Now, fibre can be, <laughs> it can be hard to explain uh, because you see slides like this. It is bloody confusing. And I want to try and lead you through uh, what I did in my PhD. I've worked to some of the, the Europeans and also my supervisor, Mingan Chok, is probably the best, let's say, uh, fibre guru, uh, NSP guru, functional fibre guru that um, we know. I just want to point out here that so many nutritionists still use crude fibre. Crude fibre is meaningless, or it, it, it's only measuring a very, very small amount of the inert fibre in the diet. So I suppose another take-home point, stop formulating on crude fibre. There's a lot better analysis to, to formulate on, and I'll go into that soon. The only reason why crude fibre is good is to put in a, a, the net energy, Noble net energy for um, equation. Uh, that's because it's a great measure of inert fibre, indigestible fibre. That's all it's good for. <coughs> so, to go into a little bit more detail. So, uh, two levels of fibre, soluble and insoluble. Most of the fibre we have in our diets is insoluble. But when we have pectins, for example, from, from uh, uh, soy hulls, they, some of that is, is soluble. And the pectins in, in soy hulls, up to 90% of that's digested before it reaches the large intestine, particularly in the sow. Uh, sugar beet pulp uh, has the same net energy as wheat because it ferments, it calms the sow, she sleeps more, and therefore it lowers our maintenance requirement. So it's a hard concept to... To, um, to come across, but we're still learning. But if we break the, the fibre into all these components, the more viscous, soluble fibre, it, it's like a gel, like a weight loss you see in humans where you, you drink your pectin and it and forms a gel in the stomach. The same thing can happen in a, in a pig, and that creates satiety and, and reduces um, aggression. Of course, the, 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 uh, the soluble starches and sugars is, is basically an energy component that has no real functionality at all. But the best functional fibre is the hemicellulose, the, the NDF, uh, of want of a better word, and I'll go into reasons why we're probably NDF is the, the best uh, fibre fraction measurement to, to formulate on at the moment. Because it not only increases the tidy, it actually promotes beneficial bacteria. Um, and increases water holding capacity. So maximising water holding capacity increases gut fill. <clears throat> inert cellulose, uh, there's some good parts about inert cellulose and lignified cellulose because the right amount, particularly even from wheat mids, it contains uh, enough to maximise water holding capacity. But when you look at DGDS, um, it doesn't have the functionality like wheat mids and, and soy hulls do, for example. So I know this is a, a quite a, um, a detailed slide, but I just wanted to, to focus on that fibre has a functional fibre. Its functional fibre has its best effects in the stomach and in the large intestine. So in the stomach, it's all about reducing gastric emptying in time. So I suppose the best way to describe that is if we have uh, more fibre in the, in the stomach, it's like putting casein to a wiener diet. You get that clotting effect, so you don't have that big bolus of nutrients going down the small intestine. So we can put in functional fibre, whether it's soluble or, or insoluble, water holding capacity actually uh, increases um, 
the digestibility of that diet, reduces pH, we're actually improving FCR in finisher pigs by having just the right amount of functional fibre. Um, and that's a, different, that's a whole different presentation. And then <clears throat> there's, there's things you can go into into the small intestine, but really when you look at the large intestine, uh, it's all about the, uh, the, the whole water holding capacity and maintaining satiety, gut fill. Uh, so we re reduce uh, regression, etc. Now, I don't know whether it's I'm uh, gloating or not, but sometimes it's a, it's a real pain to have that many raw materials available. But in a drought, uh, sometimes we have chickpeas and lentils, um, mung beans, etc. And we need to know what they do, cause, and we need to know how much we can feed. Uh, we need to know the lignin levels. You know, too much lignin, we reduce the digestibility of the diet. Uh, Pectin. Pectin's great for sows, but it's not good for wiener pigs because it causes scours. It's got too much rapid fermentation. And uh, too much rapid fermentation in the small intestine affects the ileal break, and that has a negative effect on feed intake too. So there's benefits um, in older sows, but also we need to, to be able to measure this. But to simplify this and, and look at raw materials that are mostly available in North America, for, ex for example, and you look at the NDF, and how that is related to the water holding capacity and the other aspects of functional fibre. And when you look at a, a, the NDF in a, uh, a corn soy based diet, it's quite a lot lower than a wheat canola based diet, for example. And even though the water holding capacity might be a little bit higher, uh, the, the functionality of fibre is the, let's say, the, the hemicellulose component or the NDF which maintains its structure which is able to hold water right through the GI tract. It's useless if it's digested, fermented, and doesn't reach to the, uh, small uh, the large intestine. They can't hold water. Uh, mash diets are better than pelleted diets. When we pellet a diet, we actually do reduce the functionality of some of that fibre. And I suppose it really does depend on the availability of wheat mids and soy hulls. I know a lot of you are probably thinking, well, how much are you going to increase the, the cost of my gestation diet? And I think we need to start spending more money on a gestation diet and rethink fibre. And it does improve digestibility, improves the satiety, but also it reduces the stress in the sow. And if you haven't got soy hulls or wheat mids, there's some really good uh, lignified cellulose products on the market now. Um, one of them is Arbacel, uh, which is one of the first on the market. There's probably three or four alternatives at the moment. And it has massive ability to hold water, 800%. Uh, eight, so I suppose a, a good demonstration, I'm not trying to sell Arbacel, because there is other products um, out there, but you know, 25 grams holding uh, that um, 200 ml of water. That's where we need to be to maximise gut fill and increase the satiety. So you don't have to add too much of this. It looks expensive. It's, uh, it's uh, around about $2 US a kilo, but it's a bit of a... Uh, it's, it's a bit of bucket science in a way, and it, put in as much as you can afford. And uh, there's times where you might have a great buy on soy hulls or wheat mids. There's some times in Australia where we have droughts and there's no fire at all and we have to be more reliant on this. Just to try and visualise it a bit more, <clears throat> uh, during my time at River Lee and uh, just researching, see what a pig can do and how much wheat mids a wiener pig could eat, just for oh, the term we use in Australia for shits and giggles, decided to compare a, a normal nursery diet against a diet that contained 50%, 5-0% wheat mids. And the pigs on the 50% wheat mid diet grew exactly the same, had the same live weight after three weeks. They ate 30% more and 30% worse FCR. And when we PM'd and, and took samples uh, from, from the piglet, the ones on the normal nursery diet, we you know, cooked wheat and 20% and, uh, uh, lactose, so very high-powered uh, diet. They're like flat footballs. We opened up the pigs with contained 50% mill run, and they were al almost like footballs were about to explode. So it shows the capacity, and if you, you take this um, 
to the sow and if you're maximising the functional fibre. Imagine the, the well-being of that, that, that sow when we actually try to uh, reduce feed intake and minimise weight gain because there will be times when you go store free, particularly when you use electronic feeding, that sows will get fat. And so just to use this concept of using functional fibre, again, to reduce stress levels and, and uh, um, maintain that satiety. <clears throat> I suppose there's a few vets in here, I'm not quite sure that most of you have done a PM on a pig, but it's quite interesting uh, when we look at the terminal EM and, and particularly the cecum, where if we put in either highly fermentable NSP from sugar beet pulp or from, from, uh, from soy hulls, and causing, causing that uh, distension, on, it's not the right word, but gut fill in the cecum. It's quite interesting when you open up a pig that this area is wrapped around the duodenum. So if we can get the balance right, we've got this uh, gut fill here and distension here in the, in the cecum, wrapped around here and again, creating that, that fill effect uh, for the sow. But I think really in North America, um, line up the purchasing department and see how many wheat, uh, wheat mids and, or so, so, soy hulls uh, that you can get and it's worthwhile spending money on. What I'm and we are recommending as a group from our research in Australia is a minimum NDF. Most nutritionists will have NDF uh, analysis uh, in, in their raw, raw material database recommending anything from uh, 18 to 25, ideally around about 21% NDF to m maximise gut fill and satiety. This is on a palleted diet, so you probably uh, get away of 2% less on a mash diet, which I no doubt a lot of you are feeding mash diets. And oh, okay, again, it's another, another presentation if you want to go into pre-lactation, lactation levels, we can see how we're uh, manipulating the functional fibre using NDF is probably the best uh, measurement we know of at the moment. Maybe in the, maybe in the future you know, we'll have lignin and, and pectin a part of that, but let's just keep it simple at the moment. So electronic sow feeders, or electronic sow feeding versus head stalls or, or shoulder stalls, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there was a lot of angle grinders that came out and there's a lot of shoulder stores. There still is in Australia, uh, just because uh, the, the capital investment and I suppose more conservative operations just didn't want to go and don't want to spend money on, on electronic sow feeding. But what we've found, and I'd say it'd be close to 25%, and that's growing all the time, 25% of the sows, just adding sows in Australia, are on an electronic sow feeder and knowing where the industry is going, um, there's big operation pulling them out because it was a very inferior uh, electronic sow feeder and very poor software. So they got sick of it and they've gone back to, to head stalls. So, but majority of the industry is moving this way. So really, compared to shoulder head stalls, it's been total born. Uh, we are averaging the best um, operations and well-designed units using electronic sow feeders. They're over 90% farrowing rate. Uh, summer, 92, 93. A little bit more difficult during summer, probably back to high 80s. Um, but electronic sow feeding, it's, it's all about precision feeding. And uh, I think we've got a bit of a workshop tomorrow, but I'm a big fan of, of phase feeding in gestation. And, uh, or last couple of slides or a level amount of slides or we'll go into that more detail as well. <clears throat> but the biggest advantage of electronic sow feeders is reducing feed wastage and reducing maintenance requirement. I know it's a big figure, 20%. I thought it would be 10% and the initial figures were around about that area, but gee, that's easy to pay off ESF if, if that's the case. Your cells get fat. Uh, every operation I've been in who've put in electronic cell feeders, they've got fat. Because of the re large and significant reduction in maintenance requirement, and I just don't realise how much less uh, wastage there is. But that can be fixed, uh, and a well-designed uh, uh, operation, and also just reducing the level of feed in mid-gestation, 
uh, is a way to, to take that weight off the sow. But it will take time. Normally two gestations to, to, re, to take off one condition score we usually aim on. An old stalwart, uh, Rob Johnson from PIC Australia, um, we sat down over a couple of red wines uh, last year and he had a bit, lot of experience in head stalls and then quite recently he's had several operations of his that converted to uh, electronic sale feeders. And I didn't realise, but if you include uh, returns, uh, not in pig days, uh, nips where we miss the returns and, and the sale's gone all the way through without being detected, in shoulder head stalls, it's more like 1.4 tonne a year, uh, over around about 3,000 pounds. And that's a lot more than I expected. Uh, but when you're going stall free and, and going cheap, a cheaper option or a, let's say a, uh, a more simple option of head stalls, the, uh, the feed intake and feed wastage does go up. I've got quite conservative uh, with that reduction in, in feed wastage. Rob Johnson was saying it's almost 300 kilograms per sow per year he's saving. Um, and that's information that's just become available probably over the last three or four months. That's a huge reduction. So, of course, with uh, feed prices at the moment, um, you see that uh, it's saving almost 100 US per sow per year and makes paying off AESF um, a lot quicker. And, uh, in Australia, uh, the, the cost of an ESF is $150 per sow. Um, it's a, quite a, a quick payback comparing, and considering if you have to go store free, uh, the other benefits and reproductive benefits um, of, of an ESF. Sure, fee costs will come down, that payback won't be as good maybe in the future, but it is a very handy payback at the moment. <clears throat> Where we got it wrong, a lot of operations just went cheap. Uh, they, they went the tried and true uh, ESFs, maybe 20 years old, and had very poor software. One major company decided to buy uh, components of ESF, build the rest themselves, and design their own software. What could go wrong? And, it, it, and in saying that, these units were the best performing units for nine months of the year. But because it was inferior software and inferior ESF, uh, it, you calibrated the ESF and a week later it was overfeeding again. And we had, they had sows that looked like bison. Trouble is for three months a year during summer, uh, farrowing rate crashed or conception rates crashed about 55%. So you can get it wrong. Design is everything. Um, this is a, a photo, I think I just got off the web, where if you get design wrong, you'll have sows sleeping in front, particularly aggressive sows, sleeping in front of the, the doorway of the ESF, and then you'll have a lot of non-feeding events because you go through the report every day and, and uh, uh, you do measure how many sows have eaten their total allocation. Most of the sows eat their allocation in one, one, one feeding but poorly designed units, you get a lot of sales, particularly submissive sales, just don't have the allocation and of course their reproductive performance is going to go backwards. Uh, I've never seen so much fighting in poorly designed uh, and small pens. Typical farmer, if you want to try and, yeah, you spend a lot of money on an on a, a electronic sale feeder and you want to put as many sales as possible, don't. Uh, go to... Uh, the guys at, at Gestall and get your uh, maximum amount of sales per feeder and stick to it, uh, particularly for gilts. Do, you know, do, not over, um, do not crowd or overstock uh, gilts. Uh, normally our stocking rates with gilts and parity ones is about 15% uh, lower than older parities. Uh, just one last thing, one of the, if you don't get buy and by staff, and they're not adjusting and not monitoring uh, the, the units and the software and the reports, uh, it's going to fail. I've known of one senior manager who was a total control freak and he didn't like that information going into the cloud. So uh, vets, nutritionists and even senior management can actually look at what he was doing uh, to point that that's one of the units where they're ripping out ESFs because didn't get buy-in from management and staff. 
Just quickly, uh, this is a slide that I robbed from Lance Bongard from uh, Iowa State University from our uh, internal conference four weeks ago. We forget about the effects of psychological stress. You know, when the cells under stress, suddenly uh, uh, prostaglandin go through the roof, more prostaglandin, we depress progesterone and we reduce embryo survival. Not only that, that you have a poorly designed unit, um, like this one here, then you're going to get uh, prolonged stress is going to cause uh, gut damage, leaky gut, etc. And then you've got uh, lipopolysaccharides entering the bloodstream, and that can cause a cascade of other problems uh, <laughs> listed there. Again, this from uh, the, the Iowa State crew, um, increased cortisol, uh, delayed or inhibition of, of ovulation. Uh, abortions, etc. So we need to reduce the amount of stress uh, in store free, you know, whether it's functional fibre or design, etc. Uh, because these are the these are the things that can happen if we uh, don't get it right. So this is a typical uh, uh, feeding program and, and nutrients uh, or uh, energy and and uh, SID lysine. We're feeding in Australia at the moment. We tend to be on the lower side because we've got a lot of barley and wheat uh, and uh, we tend to be increasing the level of SID because our sows are of a lower intake um, and we're finding that with the modern sow, we just need to feed more lysine uh, and, of course, balanced amino acids in, in gestation. So in the first 28 days, uh, we're around about that, a bit over 5 pound, 5.3 pound, and then... From day 28, we wind the feeding rate right, right back to managed body condition. Uh, we've got the main aim to be is probably average 26 to 28 megajoules of uh, digestible energy uh, per day. If we've got fat cells, we actually want to add down to almost 22 uh, megajoules. So that's 1.6 to, to 1.7 kilograms a day. And we're still getting very good performance, but only in mid-gestation, not early and not late. And of course, if the sow is skinny, uh, that's easy to put on weight. Now, I know we're going to go into and talk about uh, the, the pros and cons of bump, bump feeding uh, tomorrow. Uh, we are recommending a higher plane of nutrition and, and change in the diets and increasing mainly the essential amino acids, but not talking about kilograms, a slight increase in, in uh, nutrient intake in that last um, uh, three or four weeks of gestation. Except for the PIC genotype, they are recommending the after 28 days and keeping that, that feeding rate all the way through. They want sows hungry uh, going into, into the farrowing house so they eat. The PIC genotype in Australia is generally of a very lean genotype and it's very hard to get feed into her during lactation, so that's why they do that. I'm not a big fan of that idea and process, but uh, well, I think we can discuss that tomorrow with, with that group we're going to be involved with. <clears throat> this is interesting data from Holland. So they measured the running average weekly weight of 660,000 sows. And while there was a gradual increase in um, body weight. The running average from day uh, zero of gestation right to 15, there is some weeks of putting on five kilograms. But at day 35, they didn't put on anything and some sales were losing weight during that week. Um, and talking to Rob Johnson from PIC, he says if he does his report, and there's going to be a number of sows that don't eat their total allocation, as in they might be on a, um, a two kilogram feeding level, it's going to be during that day 35. So if the sows aren't going to put on weight and they're not going to be hungry, why not reduce feeding levels during that mid uh, gestation if we need to take uh, either weight off the sow or maintain body weight? But I think we need to be, do a bit more research. I suppose if you look at, um, you know, I'll go into ne next slides, but the, look at the dynamics of you know, when uh, there's percentile growth, when there's fluid, uh, et cetera. Um, I shuffled the, the slides around a bit, but just one point. 
when we've got a, a Linux uh, RFID tag in a cell, uh, we can put in a reader anywhere, whether it's where measuring uh, live weight, uh, you name it, having sprays if she goes to a different area, um, being able to go, OK, she's, she's due to vaccine, uh, due to, to um, uh, go out into a faring house. Uh, we have some units that have four different colours. Um, so the, world, the world's your oyster by having that RFID tag. Eventually, we'll have GBS tracking like we do in dairy. Uh, for instance, uh, if it, um, the, the GPS tracking, they can tell when a, a dairy cow's on heat. I don't think it's too far away uh, with, with this type of um, RFID tags uh, in sales. Um, quickly, we've got software where we can actually, ch the, the, the feeder automatically changes the feeding rate. So if that sow, and when they, if we've got the ability to be able to weigh the sow automatically, there's software to automatically change that feeding rate because if she's too fat or put on a, I say, a, a skinny Jenny Craig diet and vice versa, vice versa. And this is uh, real data showing that how we're able to manually change body weight. But I know there's a Dutch group um, which, uh, um, and not only, uh, which are providing a service all over the world to a number of different ESF uh, companies to be able to a third party and, and change automatically change feeding rates. I uh, did mention this slide, so I suppose the next uh, uh, nine slides or so, I suppose I'll, I'll put into my um, the value of phase feeding during gestation because there's a lot of changes that occur. Uh, this is a, a slide I got from, from Heidi Van Slight, who I work very closely with, who's a consultant in Australia. So you look at the differences of time when placenta are in fluids, um, mammy gland. Uh, this is a slide I bor borrowed from uh, um, Steve Wilson from Four Farmers. And when you look at the amount of udder growth in the last three weeks and what that does to amino acid requirement, so there's a lot of changes occurring to station. It's very hard to get right when you only got one diet. And another slide I, I uh, borrowed from Steve Wilson. Uh, look at the amino acid requirement for the udder, in, particularly in that last uh, uh, three weeks. Now, Keith Hayden in the audience, I know I'm trying to sell a bit more threonine and valine, but uh, there is a quite differences in amino acid balance depending on the time of gestation. So keeping this in mind, and I might just go through this slide quickly, there has been a large progression in how we're feeding the sow, and I think the, the, the latest uh, progression is to phase feed. Bump feeding or increasing energy in late gestation does not work, um, we, but we need to change the diet and actually maximise or increase essential amino acid uh, requirement and intake. And it's not only lysine, we need to feed more isoleucine, valine, and th particularly threonine. Uh, it's a good paper, good review, and when we're talking about increasing energy, of course you can't increase energy too much, too quickly, uh, during that, the last three weeks, because the sow just won't eat uh, during um, lactation, uh, because you're just uh, uh, increasing non-sterified fatty acids uh, in the bloodstream. Interestingly, in the view where the sow uh, did increase weight gain, as you expect. There was an increase in birth weight by 28 grams, but the variation was 20. So increasing energy by um, that 6 to 30 megajoules, we know it, it does not work, but I think we do need a late gestation diet in better balance and particularly um, maximising essential amino acid intake. When I was... Um, and I've been over to North America, it must be 20 times now, when I saw Ron Ball's presentation where he's putting sows in metabolism chambers and, and heat chambers and measuring radioactive um, or radio radioactive labelling amino acids and he's able, to, he's able to measure the requirement through the whole of gestation of particular amino acids. And this is one of Ron's slides showing what he found of the, uh, the central amino acid requirement compared to, say, what the NRC, and one of those was threonine, and more right lately uh, was valine. So we decided to get funding uh, from APL, uh, went to a commercial unit in uh, one of the innovators I was talking about before, 
and going on the plane of uh, early, uh, early gestation where we're feeding that higher level and looking at the PIC recommendations compared to uh, the higher plane in nutrition, what Ron Ball was uh, researching and looking at in late gestation. So you notice there that Ron uh, recommendations is to really crank down and, and limit the amount of energy during mid gestation. And uh, that's what we are doing now. But on the back end, increasing um, feed intake, but also most of that was increasing uh, SOD lysine and uh, the changing the threonine to lysine ratio. Uh, this was presented, I think, in 2020 in Omaha, Midwest Animal Science, and showing able to get a 50 gram increase in birth weight, but the biggest effects was actually subsequent re reproductive performance. Um, and also uh, less variation in, in, in litter weight. There was KSU data, and I think it's even Nebraska, but maybe even um, some Canadian research as well. I think uh, Hyatt was uh, involved in some of that, showing that sows on a better plane of nutrition in late gestation, uh, the progeny are getting to market four to five days earlier. Uh, it's quite compelling, and that's what we can do with ESFs, be able to manage uh, that type of phase feeding. A uh, couple last slides. We have three clients, customers, putting wean sales into gestation and on straw, and they're, they're AIing, PCIing, in the actual gestation pen. So I ask the question, is this the death of mating sheds? And I know there's a lot of larger groups looking at this now. And... God knows where <laughs> supermarkets going to take us. I know there's a lot of outdoor sales in New Zealand and also UK, but uh, there are ESFs out there to be able to uh, go off grid and uh, and look at uh, outdoor sales. I hope we don't go this way, but just to let you know that um, this is an area we're, we're looking at. We're probably in Australia. There's 35,000 sales are outdoors. Just lastly, and my, this is the, the, the second last slide, Hyatt asked me to give our own experiences of farrow feeders. So this changing tact away from uh, ESFs to farrow feeders. These are rolling out like beer on a 40 degree day in Australian outback. Uh, the lack of staff at the moment. I remember when I was uh, in my early days of pig production, the thing I most hated was that last feed in the farrowing house. And there's a lot of things we're getting wrong. So majority, uh, say majority, the, the, uh, the, the innovators are using farrow feeders, um, are feeding 40% of the requirements in the morning, really small amounts during the day, and when in summer, sometimes they're skipping or delaying that uh, later afternoon feed, and they're going to, to 9 p.m. in the summer, and that's where that 30% top up is. So it's just maximising the energy uh, so when the sales, majority of sales are faring, 60% of sales are faring in the evening, they've got the energy. And talking to Stuart Neuendorf, um, who was the first one to put these in four, five years ago, he said the biggest effect was reducing the, the weaning to mating interval by half a day. And we know the advantages of that. And he was getting uh, really significant improvements in, in Born Alive. But there's... It did, he did stipulate that while it is uh, labour saving, and I think he, he put out some numbers that he could pay, could pay off these uh, farrow feeders off in three years just by saving labour. And of course, there's other benefits of going this angle. So, um, yeah, great experiences so far. It is a big investment. But where staffing is going in the future, um, I highly recommend that um, you, you look at this area of, um, of feeding technology. So the sky won't fall. I know, and yes, there will be changes. It is going to be more training of staff. There will be more capital requirements, but there is a really good payback, particularly at this time of age, or t times of high feed costs and, uh, and finding it very hard to get labour. So, I don't mind a beer. So, uh, if you're question time and you want to come up and want any more information, I've got my computer here. I can pass on a lot of data. 
whether it's on the functional fibre or even my own personal experiences, be happy to talk about that later. So thank you. <laughs>